Our speaker today is Stephen Herman. And any introduction to Stephen Herman best begins with an introduction to William Everson. William Everson was a brilliant poet of the San Francisco Renaissance who joined the Catholic Church and the Dominican Order in 1951, taking the name Brother Antoninus. In 1956, he encountered Victor White, who introduced him to the works of Carl Jung, which he voraciously devoured. Antoninus wrote a long erotic poem called River Root Asizigi, which he saw as a complete rewriting of the Song of Songs. Antoninus left the order and the Catholic Church by disrobing himself of his religious habit following an electrifying poetry reading at UC Davis on December 7th, 1969. Everson taught a famous class called Birth of a Poet at UC Santa Cruz, where our speaker, Stephen Herman, became his teaching assistant in 1980. Stephen Herman's conversations with Everson became his first book, William Everson, The Shaman's Call. Stephen Herman went on to work with another modern shaman, Donald Sandner, at the C.G. Young Institute. Sandner conducted a long inquiry into the relationship between Jungian psychology and shamanism. In addition to numerous articles and reviews, Stephen Herman has written five books that explore the relationship between poetry, shamanism, and Jungian psychology. They include Spiritual Democracy, The Wisdom of Early American Visionaries for the Journey Forward, Walt Whitman, Shamanism, Spiritual Democracy, and the World Soul. Emily Dickinson, A Medicine Woman for Our Times. His latest book is called William James and C.G. Young, Doorways to the Self. It should be on sale very soon from Analytical Psychology Press. And if you go to their website, uh, it's all one word, www.analyticalpsychologypress.com. And uh, look for Stephen Herman, you will find this book. And I can send that link out later and put it up on our Facebook page. Stephen Herman is a Jungian analyst with a private practice in Montclair. Please give a warm welcome for Stephen Herman. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Stephen. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm. I'm very happy to be able to be speaking about this subject, which has uh, been very uh, dear to me since, as uh, Stephen mentioned, I uh, had the pleasure of taking William Everson's course at UC Santa Cruz. Now, this was a course in charismatic vocation, not confined to poets alone, but to any student who had a calling. Um, the aim of the course was to see if you could confirm your vocation through your dream life. Mm -hmm. And I was asked by Bill to uh, be his teaching assistant when I was an undergraduate in the experimental psychology program. Um, I wrote a paper in a transitional moment um, on vocation. It was a 44 page paper and section seven of that paper, which I wrote in 1979 uh, for a tutorial uh, under Everson's tutelage was called um, Vocational Dreams and Synchronistic Phenomena. So I've been sitting on this material happily for 41 years. Um, and it's a delight to be able to uh, speak about it today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start the um, uh, screen share here. Um, can you all see that now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So um, I wanted to just say a couple of things about my work under Everson. Um, one was that he um, read the paper and gave me a very wonderful uh, glowing narrative evaluation that meant a great deal to me as a young man of 23. Um, 
The subject for today comes from that paper. Um, it's now being published, uh, the idea, uh, the notion, in chapter 37 of my new book, um, which you can see here, William James and C. G. Jung, Doorways to the Self. And um, here's a picture of someone we're all familiar with, C. G. Jung. Uh, here's William James, the founder of American psychology and the father of pragmatism in America, who Jung had the great pleasure of meeting in 1909 when he traveled to Clark University with Sigmund Freud and Sandor Ferenczi. Jung met William James a second time, although it's not generally known, in 1910. He came a second time to the States and uh, had a long walking uh, tour with James when James told him he could hear his heart beating. And William James died shortly thereafter, after a uh, tour through Switzerland, where he visited Zurich, and then uh, died after his return to America. Now, I mentioned the uh, paper I wrote uh, for Everson's tutorial. At the same time I was finishing that paper, I had a uh, vocational dream. This was a dream uh, involving a, an ascent to a, a mountaintop with a colleague, a friend uh, at the university uh, who was in a pro seminar on Jung with me. And we were uh, ascending the mountain and uh, then uh, I went back down to the shores of the lake, which was somewhere in California, and um, foothills of the Sierras, no, no doubt. And I encountered this king snake uh, with these uh, cosmic looking eyes with a spiral looking galaxy that uh, circumambulated or spiraled inward toward a center with stars in the eyes. And that snake um, began to uh, move towards the Kresge Town Hall where Everson taught his course. Um, I uh, walked with a uh, religious studies teacher of mine to the town hall. And after that dream, I decided to leave the experimental psychology program at uh, Cal College and um, write my own individual major in depth psychology and religion. Here's a, a picture of uh, my king snake drum. This is a Taoist drum I purchased uh, in 1995, and as Stephen mentioned, uh, I was uh, seeing Don Sander at the time in analysis, and uh, he played a big uh, role in. Um, inspiring me to go down and interview uh, Everson before he died on the subject of shamanism in American poetry. Here's a, a spiral galaxy um, mirroring the eyes of the snake or vice versa. This is a picture of William Everson. By this time, this picture was taken in the late 70s when I knew him as William Everson. Before that, he had been Brother Antoninus. He left the religious order, uh, disrobed himself at UC Davis, and uh, went to a little uh, shop in Mill Valley and found a bear claw necklace and a buckskin vest, and he wore that as his new mantle, uh, as he said, uh, as a, uh, a Latter-day poet shaman. And that's how I knew him. He was 44 years my senior. He was like a wise old man, uh, a Jungian scholar and poet, Jungian poet of the Pacific uh, Coast. Lived in Santa Cruz. Now, I mentioned the dream of the snake. Um, and on November 7th, and that was shortly after that dream, I was sitting outside the provost's office at Cal College, who was also my religious studies teacher. He taught uh, 
introduction to Indic religious traditions and Buddhism. And I had taken his course and I was gonna go speak to him about changing my major. And I had decided that I was going to write my major, my thesis, my senior thesis on Meister Eckhart and Carl Jung, Recollections of the Self. And as I was waiting for um, Jack to come, Jack Angler was, is his name. Um, I was sitting uh, beneath some redwood trees on the UC Santa Cruz campus and a young woman approached me. And she started to speak to me in a German accent and I asked her her name. And she told me her name was Gabriella Eckhart. So when she said that, uh, I began speaking German with her for about 10 minutes or so. And she told me she was from Carmel uh, by the sea, Carmel, California, where I was born. Well, by the time I got uh, ready to enter Jack's office, I had made up my decision because as I said, this part seven of that paper that I was writing at this time and ready to submit to Everson it was called, um, vocational dreams and synchronistic events. And uh, I had never uh, met uh, a young uh, woman or any person with the last name of Eckhart here in, in the States. So it was one of those coincidences that Jung speaks about in his uh, monograph on synchronicity that was so baffling uh, and beyond uh, statistical probability that I said, I think that I know what I'm gonna do and and that confirmed my decision. This is a, uh, a plaque on the uh, Predigerkirche. This is the church of Meister Eckhart in Erfurt, Germany. And Eckhart lived from 1260 to 1328. And uh, I wrote a thesis on Eckhart, as I said. Now, right after I made my decision and submitted my um, new uh, major to the, um, to the university, and it became official, I took a class called Explorations of the Self, where we were uh, reading William James's uh, masterpiece, The Varieties of Religious Experience. Now, this house uh, was occupied by Jung and his family in the year 1909. The, right around the same time he returned from his trip to America where he met William James. You can see the, the beautiful architecture there. This is the front door to Jung's house in Kusnacht, for those of you who haven't seen it or been there. There I am standing at the doorway. This was in 2008 when I delivered a paper at the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And here above the door, we read vocatus atque non vocatus deus aderit, which translates as called or not called, God will be present. This is a back view of Carl Jung's home from the lake of Zurich side. And after Jung's break with Sigmund Freud, most of you know, he began to engage in a building game on the shores of the lake that reminded him of childhood play activities where he constructed a little church and he was looking for a stone and found a red pyramidal stone that he used as the uh, spire or the, um, the roof of the church. And uh, it was a pyramidal stone that was just right. Uh, there's a synchronicity for you. And at that moment, Jung remembered his dream from the age of three of a great underground phallus that stood about 12 feet high on a throne with an eye looking motionlessly upward and an aura of brightness, as he said, shining above it. This was the dream that sealed Jung's vocation. 
although he didn't know it until he remembered that dream, even though he'd been playing a, a little game with a little mannequin where reveries from that dream were still alive and active during his latency years. I wrote my dissertation, uh, Vocational Development in Childhood, and spoke at length about that dream. Um, Jung wrote down his fantasies very carefully in his black books and his red book. And this was done in a, a calligraphic script with great uh, beauty. Now, this is a very important point in understanding uh, vocation. Uh, this uh, midlife transition that Jung spoke of. Um, Jung said the onset of midlife is around uh, 35. This happens to co coincide exactly with his uh, chance uh, meetings with James at 34 and 35. In the midst of this period, Jung wrote in his memories, dreams, reflections, when I was so preoccupied with the images of the unconscious, I came to the decision to withdraw from the university where I lectured for eight years as privat docent. My experience and experiments with the unconscious had brought my intellectual activity to a standstill. After the completion of the psychology of the unconscious, I found myself utterly incapable of reading a scientific book. This went on for three years. Imagine Carl Jung with the intellect that he had not reading a scientific book for three years. What was he doing? Well, he was working on his red book, re relating well to his family and seeing patients, but he was also engaging in play activities and working with painting and stones. Here we have a picture of a stone figure that was carved in the year 1920. The unconscious gave the name Atma Victu, which means the breath of life, the breath of life. 1920. Here it is in the garden at Kusnacht, standing near an evergreen. And you'll see several pictures of this figure. I, I was fascinated with it when I saw it. Atma Viktu, first spelled with a K, was a fantasy figure that emerged in C.G. Jung's Black Book on the 6th of April in 19... Uh, uh, Black Book 6 on April 25th, 1917. This is a picture from below, looking up at the uh, face and upper torso of the figure. Now the influenza, which was called the Spanish flu by some, broke out in February of 1918 and it ended in April of 1920. So this figure was carved exactly a hundred years ago. And I think it stands as a, a symbol of hope during this current COVID-19 pandemic that we're going through. It's said that 50 million people died during the 1918-1919 pandemic lasted till early 1920 in April. So we're looking at a figure that's a uh, hundred years old here. It's beautifully preserved. There's another uh, image of Atma Victu. Now here's a, a photograph that gives you perspective. You see the uh, tree standing tall above the figure.
Now, Jung speaks of dreams as facts, and he says that he avoided all theoretical points of view during this period he wasn't reading scientific texts, and simply helped the patients to understand the dream images by themselves without application to rules and theories. In Jung's view, dreams are the facts from which we must proceed. Significantly, these statements came right after the place in his book, which was really co-authored with his secretary, Aniela Yaffe, where the a chapter on William James was supposed to have been placed. This is the Count Way Library manuscript or CLM at Harvard Medical School, which I had the good fortune to have been able to research. And it's a fascinating document. And what it shows is that between the chapter on Sigmund Freud and the confrontation of the unconscious was a chapter on Theodore Flournoy and C.G. Jung and William James that was omitted. This is a very significant piece of writing. It's short and very packed. And I've been doing some, I, I speak about it in my new book. And now, um, as I mentioned, uh, I wrote my thesis on Meister Eckhart in 1980 and 81. Well, in Jung's memoir, he said, only in Meister Eckhart did I feel the breath of life. Did I feel the breath of life, you see? Well, there's, there's that breath of life again, Atma Victu, the breath of life. So somehow in Jung's reading of Eckhart, which started at the age of 15, and I do discuss this in my book on James and Jung, um, there was a, uh, an experience he had of something transcendent. This is the bell tower at Eckhart's church in Erfurt, the Prediger Kirche. This is the inside um, door, the doorway inside the church on the left side of the door. You can see the uh, seat where Meister Eckhart gave his sermons, uh, all in German here and Latin. I had about um, 15 dreams uh, involving Meister Eckhart in a period of seven years. It's important when you uh, have these dreams to document them and write them down in your journal and preserve them because by meditating on them, eventually um, you began to get some insight into their meaning and what significance they hold for your life as a whole. Now I mentioned this chance meeting with Gabriella Eckhart out of the blue as an instance of synchronicity. As a, and as I say here, such experiences don't uh, fit neatly on any uh, bell curve. Hier wirkte Meister Eckhart um 1260 bis 1327 als Mönch und Prior del Dominico. Translated, here worked Meister Eckhart 1260 to 1327 as monk and prior of the Dominicans. There's the bell for you. I had a dream, uh, dream two that I recorded about Eckhart, about a bell that I had found that belonged to Meister Eckhart. And when I went to visit the church, uh, preacher's church, where he was the prior, uh, I saw this bell and it, it rang a bell, <laughs> literally. <laughs> I remembered my dream. And uh, these things are marvelous when they do happen to us. Jung also, also used the words compensatory dreams or teleological dreams. They point toward the future. So, uh, so you can have a dream that doesn't really come into manifestation in a practical way, sometimes tw until 20 years later. And that's why I think it's so valuable to keep your journal because you can go back and read them. And that, that way you get some distance, some objectivity, what Jung called 
uh, psychic objectivity. And he learned this from William James and from Theodore Flournoy. The concept of detachment from the emotional object, uh, the ability to uh, reflect um, from what he called the transcendent function. You see, this is also part of uh, Jung's meditations on psychological type is this idea of a transcendent function that it is made up of many functions. Uh, the ability to hold uh, a larger breadth of um, patterns of and energies of psychological type to borrow uh, the title of uh, John Beebe's new book. Um, the, the vocational dreams come out of this deep foundation with messages for the conscious mind. And, and sometimes they, they emerge in what William James called a, um, a transmarginal field, which is a field between. It's, it's uh, like you're mentioning the analytic relationship between a patient and a therapist or an analyst. There's a field in between. Jung said oftentimes we dream, we, we don't dream, we dream out of what's between ourselves and a patient. So if we're working with a patient and the patient's looking for a vocational dream, something can happen, something can emerge uh, that uh, turns on a light bulb and helps uh, illuminate uh, the path ahead. And oftentimes this comes from a dream, like Jung's great dream of Philemon. You know, that was a, a turning point for Jung. Jung was, Jung was more influenced by James than most people know because that chapter has been missing. And so we have a, what Sham Dasani calls a Freudocentric view of, of Jung because you have the chapter on Freud and then the confrontation with the unconscious and then this missing piece in between, which was Flournoy and James. I have a question. Yes. Just to go more towards a, a definition of what you would call vocation. Mm -hmm. um, I think you said earlier that it doesn't really mean career. Well, and mm -hmm. and I, just to, to say where I'm going, I, I often hope for, if I'm in the middle of some kind of intense conflict, mm -hmm. I hope for some dream to clear it up. But mm -hmm. I never really get a dream that says, okay, here's your conflict and here's how you solve it. Mm -hmm. The dream is usually completely unrelated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I've begun to think, well, I should just be looking in a different direction away from the conflict itself. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. your comments, please. Good question, Stephen. Um, the, of course, a career is also deeply connected to the vocational foundation of the personality. And uh, the hope is that the two are gonna coincide in such a way that one can achieve success in one's life through a career, a successful career, because of the fact that one is throughout one's uh, efforts to uh, wrestle with conflict, wrestle with the conflict of the opposites and engage in a dialogue with the, the unconscious or the subconscious mind as William James said. One then can connect with the streams of consciousness that are already there in the unconscious. This is a term from William James too, the streams of consciousness. There are streams of consciousness going on all the time, but we don't pay attention and we don't have techniques in order to make those um, streams of consciousness self-aware in us. So we need method. We need a technique to, uh, as Jung said, find a way to make the unconscious conscious. Within all of us, there is 
a sense of knowing, a sense of knowledge about what our vocation really is, but how to tap into that, how to know what that is. This requires a certain amount of um, letting go. What James calls a religious experience. And oftentimes it comes this way with vocational dreams, that it's a, a, an experience of what Jung called the numinous. So the conflict, engaging in the conflict is good because then we wrestle with the opposites. Then we're in the, the process of the beginning to dialogue with the unconscious in the hope that something's going to emerge out of it. And, and that's what would happen in this course, Birth of a Poet. And I would read 50 dream journals each quarter and, 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 and this, every student kept a dream journal and recorded their dreams and looked to the dreams for vocational guidance. And it was really interesting to see some of these students change their majors in the middle of their career, uh, academic career. And I was actually warned by the, um, uh, by the dean of Cal College, if you do that, you're going to set, you're going to destroy your career as a, uh, as a, as a psychology professor. And I said, well, so be it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> here, I am, here I am with you teaching this course today. So, I, I, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Ah. Anyway, uh, stay with it. Stay with the conflict. You know, Jung says it's out of conflict and chaos that the uh, that the alchemical work really begins to happen. And so, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, these conflicts uh, don't stop in our lives. Can you, can you repeat the name of that paper again? Adaptation? Oh, uh, it's in, I believe it's in volume 18 of the Collected Works. Um, Jung wrote it in uh, 1916 when he was uh, working on the Red Book, and he put it in a desk drawer, and it wasn't published till uh, after his death, I believe. Uh, adaptation, individuation, and collectivity. And uh, I, uh, I do a review of that in my new book. Um, I think I have a, a section in one of the chapters on that paper because I, I think it's so important. And the reason is because he talks about uh, the, the two destinies, you see, that we have two destinies. You know, the destiny to the inner life and the destiny to the outer life, you see. This whole idea that we are just one type, that we're introverted or extroverted is not, is not accurate. We are, wholeness means a combination of these functions, you see. And uh, uh, what we uh, owe to those who we are away from during individuation, which requires a withdrawal from the world, is, as Jung says, works with individual stamp. So when he emerged from the Red Book period and he began writing two essays on analytical psychology and then psychological types, you see, and instinct and the unconscious, these papers he wrote in 1919. What we owe is out of our guilt for individuation, for being away from the world, because individuation requires solitude and inner work. What we owe is something to society, you see. And in the Red Book, he talks about what we owe to the dead, to the ancestors, to our, our, our great grandparents or ancestors we never met or even heard about. Or it could be Black Elk's great vision of the grandfathers, the, seven, the six grandfathers who came to him in the rainbow teepee and initiated him at the age of nine the age of nine, he had a vocation as to be a, a shaman for the culture, for the great Sioux, Oglala Sioux people, before the little the Battle of the Little Bighorn. He had this, this tremendous vision uh, at, at that young age in latency. 
So I've made this connection and I, I analyzed that vision in that paper I wrote in 1979 on vocation, which Everson loved. He gave me a glowing evaluation um, as an example of a vocational dream. Um, anyway, that's the title of the, I, I know I uh, got away from your question, which was very concrete and specific. It's, it's uh, that paper. And I believe it's in volume 18, Stephen. Uh, well, you expanded on a very question, <laughs> so uh, no, no apology necessary. Uh, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, uh, what is it then that inexorably tips the scales in favor of the extraordinary? It is what is commonly called vocation, an irrational factor that destines a man to a emancipate himself from the herd, from his well-worn paths. True personality is always a calling from which there is no escape. From which there is no escape. Thank you very much. This has just been an electrifying afternoon. Thank all of you, and thank you, Stephen, for hosting this. And uh, it's been my pleasure. Yeah.